Hi, welcome to the Romanov Rescue Panel uh, for LibertyCon 33 Virtual. Uh, my name is Casey Ezel, and I'm super excited to be here to talk to you guys about uh, this book. Um, with me today are my co-authors, um, which sounds really grandiose, like I did most of the work, but I did actually the least of the work, which is why I get to be moderator today. <laughs> So um, let's, uh, if you guys don't mind, let's start. Um, we'll just start with a quick introduction um, and we'll start, we'll go Mona Lisa, then Justin, and then Tom, you can uh, you can finish up. So Mona Lisa, tell the people who you are. Hi, I'm Mona Lisa Foster. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> a little background, Mona Lisa. <laughs> Oh, are you, she's, Mona Lisa's dealing with a thunderstorm, so she's having a hard time. Oh, is it still uh, bad up there? Yeah, the audio's cutting out for me. Okay, we'll come, we'll come back to your introduction, Hillbilly, we'll, you can, you can slice that in later. All right, Justin, tell the people who you are. Hi, I am Justin Watson. I'm an author of uh, science fiction and alternate history, and I'm also a veteran of the United States Army and uh, lighting and lighting control salesman by day. And this will be my first novel in print. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, Tom, your turn. Tom Crabman, retired infantry officer, uh, recovering attorney, writer for Bay and Lowe these last 15 years, 14, 18 years gone by, something like that. Um, Justin forgot to mention, he has a, an unusual knack for finding IEDs the hard way. <laughs> You build one, you build a thousand bridges. No one calls you a bridge builder. <laughs> Get blown up once. Yeah, I got yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, Mona Lisa, you want to try again for your introduction? Can you hear us? Yeah. Thank you. I'm Mona Lisa Foster. I also write science fiction. Um, I have um, a space opera novel out called Ravages of Honor, and I've been in a whole bunch of anthologies of the, in different genres. Ravages, Great. Well, Ravages is awesome, by the way. Everyone should go buy that. Ravages is awesome. Everyone should go yes, buy it. Yes, you should all go buy it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, well, so let's talk about um, how we all kind of got involved in this project. Um, and I'm going to go first because it, I just have the mic. So um, I think I came to the project last of the four of us um, because I was talking with Mona Lisa about your story in um, the, in uh, what well, it was one of Chris Kennedy's anthologies, right? For the Night Witches, where we were talking about the the unit of, um, Slip of the Surly Bonds, right? Yeah. Sur yeah. Yeah, it was, it was Slip the Surly Bonds. And it was, um, yeah, and you um, had this incredible idea for this story about these women who, um, in real history, were flying for the Soviet Air, Air Force and, and flying like old biplanes and just wreaking havoc on, on their German enemies. Um, and uh, and so yeah. you and I were talking about that. Yeah, go ahead, Mona, Mona Lisa. So I was doing some research for this short story, which was uh, supposed to be uh, about these Soviet night bombers who were called the night witches. Um, and they were a real uh, fighter squadron in in the Soviet Air Force, and I since this was supposed to be for an alt history anthology, I my uh, point of departure was that it was not Soviet, but it was Imperial, mm -hmm. and uh, it's called Catching the Dark, and it was just it was just a short story, and I, I came into this project more or less because I asked Tom about uh, the possibility of one of the Romanov girls surviving and becoming Tsarina, so that we didn't yeah. have the fall of the Romanovs, and I think that's part of how this all started. Right, right. So Tom, Mona Lisa calls you and says, what if the Romanov girls survive? E email. It was a little different oh, question. Email. The okay. question was, how do I, more or less, how do I make it so that these women fighting the Germans are not commies? Sure. And, it, you know, I, mean, I gave it some thought. And, and the answer was, you have to start about 20 years, 23 years or so before. Uh, and you can't let the commies have won then. And that just started a whole line of thought, which fed into a different book that I've been wanting to do for 50 years. Right. <laughs> um, and that's say, the one with Justin, right? No, that's exactly. Not exactly. Uh, that, that's a different one, although you, you'll be in C.J. Adler and so will he. Mm -hmm. um, 
so just the more I played with it, you know, the more I found it kind of interesting. And I don't know where the thought came uh, about rescuing the Romanovs. I, I, I think it came from reading something, something about the Africa shift. And some things oh, yeah. just sort of gelled. I said, well, there's a way to do it. Yeah. And then I talked to Mona Lisa and Justin about doing it. We made up an outline, prepared a brief, sold Tony, and the rest is going to be future alternate history. That's right. That's right. So, Justin, at what point did you did you get, I, I want to say roped in, but this really was... <laughs> <laughs> makes it sound a little less interesting. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so uh, I had been talking to Tom about Z, Z Adler, the, the book he wants to do, has been wanting yeah. to do for years. Oh, gosh. Uh, Tom, we may have been having conversations about that on Bain's Bar back in the day. So, like, this is something that I've kind of known it, about it was, for a yeah. while. It, it was a regular <laughs> subject of discussion for years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and then... Um, it came up again. We got to talking in more depth about it after uh, I had con uh, Mona Lisa, Casey, and I all contributed to Tom's uh, Terra Nova anthology uh, and kind of, you know, help help persuade the boss that uh, you know it, it teamwork is actually his forte in writing. Not nothing. Uh, it isn't, which it seems yeah. a funny thing to have to convince an infantry officer of. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> in any event, we're talking about Z Adler, and uh, as as I'm sure uh, Tom will have more commentary on my propensity for this, I tend to take the initial idea, whatever someone has, and say that's incredibly cool. Let's extrapolate that out to absurd lengths, and what would that be like in ten years and fifteen yeah. years after your point of departure? And my my point of entry was kind of like, well, that's awesome. If World War II veers off in this odd direction, I won't spoil anything. What does the Cold War look like after that? And then I had several ideas in a row for short stories set in that world, one of which, actually three of which, uh, I've written and are in those same anthologies we talked about um, from Chris Kennedy. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so, and then that, that, uh, that conversation merged with Mona Lisa's conversation with Tom all over two Liberty Cons ago. Um, and then next thing I know, we're a quartet. You know, and yep. that's and and we're working on this. So that's that's my memory of the event. And then we worked on the. Uh, uh, I put my army staff skills to use for a PowerPoint, and we had a conversation with Tony. And now yep. we're now we're on an alternate history series of grand and epic scale. Indeed, indeed. Um, volumes, if anybody's curious. If by the time we're done, I don't expect to live to see the finish of the last one. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I think you're under contract too, sir. So you know. <laughs> it, it, it's called force majeure. Uh, it's, it's there's no chance. Right. Bad heart. Uh, ever getting let, worse diabetes. I won't be there. Let's. <laughs> well, that's depressing. Let's talk about something else. Um, <laughs> what was your? More than in every uh, sense of the word. <laughs> right. Right. So. So I've worked, so this is not my first foray into alternate history, right? Um, and one of the things that I love most about working in this genre is the opportunities to do like, it's basically like a super cool research project, right? In in my opinion. Um, but uh, for me, what I got to really dig into uh, during the writing of Romanov Rescue was the... Um, kind of like how do you operate an air, an airship right how do you how does how do you run a crew in a lighter than air environment and um and what does that look like um and uh i like i i genuinely enjoyed digging into that and tom is probably the best google foo of anyone i know and he would send me these links to things like um mm -hmm. you know these old pictures of the crew that i was writing about and uh um schematics of what their what their quarters looked like on the uh you know, on the ship. Um, what about you guys? Like, what was sort of your coolest research moment while we were, you know, while we were putting this thing together? We'll start. It, uh, we'll start with Tom, since I know he's it, dying to say coolest it. Coolest research moment. It had is to it when do you set yourself Liberace. on fire? No, that, that was a good one, but it had to do with Liberace jackhammering Freddie Mercury in the middle of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Oh um, well, here we go. <laughs> This is a Russian 100 ruble note from about that time period. 
there's something in the there, there's a, a thread in the book where some people had to blow a safe and I had interpolated how much money was going to be in the safe based on about the size of a US note wrong the Russian money is four times bigger and it can only so the safe can only hold about a quarter as much unless I make the safe too big to be moved to where it can be safely blown <laughs> that was probably the worst <laughs> um uh so my in my uh the challenge i'll do one up one down i guess or at both just both kind of odd so the funny thing yeah. about the Russian civil war is um it's a very confused time uh in history uh there are conflicting accounts there's there's accepted history too don't get me wrong it's not like you can't wrap your head around it but um, English language, because unfortunately I do not actually read Russian. I'm working on it. Um, but I don't read Russian, so I have to do it in English. And getting your mind around the state of the Russian army at the end of World War I, going into the Russian Civil War, is an incredibly confused time. And it's both um, constraining, because you're trying to figure out what's true, right? We're, we're trying to do pretty strict alternate history. There's our point of departure and everything flows logically from our point of departure. We don't just make stuff up, you yeah. know, to, to the best of our ability. Um, so that's it's a constraining factor in that you're trying to figure out who was where, when. But you're also, because the Russian army is in such a state of flux mm -hmm. and units are mutinying against uh, the interim, against first the Romanovs, then the, uh, the Kerensky government, and then the Reds, and there's, you know, all this confusion back and forth in the ranks. It's actually somewhat liberating because when you have a fictional character, you can kind of ascribe to them anything that makes sense within their character because there was someone who took that path. You know, there right. was someone who started out an imperialist, ended up a communist, somebody who defected from the Reds to the Whites. Like, it's not completely absurd uh, that you would have an individual do that. Um, I would say my biggest goof uh, that Tom caught me out on is we were entering, compiling the first real draft of the story with all of our pieces forming Voltron was I had accidentally placed uh, something from the last German offensive on the Eastern Front, uh, Fauschlag, uh, was like the, the entire first, you know, call it three chapters of my contribution to the book. And that was actually impossible temporally. Because even um, I, you know, I had messed that up. It was like, oh, actually, you know, they would be, you know, they better already be at uh, Tobolsk by then, or else there's no setup whatsoever. So that was that was my biggest historical goof, going into it personally. Um, but I had a lot of fun. I was a history major in college. That's yeah, that is the uh, the Romanov rescue memorial pile. Um, <laughs> those are all the books that I. Those are not all the books I have on Russia, but those are all the books I bought specifically for Romanov Rescue and to read on it. To read on it, so yeah, that's, uh, that most of that's in my brain. I hope. Alternate cool. history is an amazing pain in the ass to write because it was <laughs> yeah. <quite> crazy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's fun. Sure. It, you know, it's great fun. The research is fun, as, as I said, mm -hmm. but but it will really drive you up a wall. Mm -hmm. What about you, Mona Lisa? What about what did you? What was your research experience like for this uh, for this project? Well, I I ran off and spent about six months looking at the at the history of Russia because I don't come from a history background, and the the imperial family in particular, and um, looking for a reason for, uh, or a way to justify a woman inheriting because they had these uh, very archaic laws that only a, a son could inherit, and. Uh, Actually, one of the more interesting characters that I found in regards to that was, uh, his, his name was Vasily Ivanovich Belovin, who was coincidentally um, not just an American citizen, but became the patriarch of Moscow. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, uh, so Belovin became uh, Bishop Tikhon, and he openly condemned uh, the killing of the Tsar's family in 1918. And he also protested against uh, the violent attacks that the Bolsheviks were conducting against the churches. So he was very outspoken. And in, in a lot of ways, he was, uh, you know, he was an American by, well, he wasn't American by choice. He was a naturalized American citizen. Mm -hmm. And I found him to be the most interesting character in, in, in my research, at least the one with um, uh, the, the ones that were approaching the point in history where we were writing about. And um, I thought he would have made a great mentor for a, a, a young Tsarina, 
um, right. to help her figure things out. So I found him to be the most interesting personality that I ran across. Um, the other thing that I that you know you, you just don't get to do for other kinds of research is I reached out to uh, the late economist Walter E. Williams, uh, and I started a, a conversation with him about how to transform agrarian Russia without communism. Unfortunately, he became ill and died. Yeah. So that we didn't get too far into that discussion, but it, it, it started out interesting. Sure. Yeah, I bet. I bet. I think that one of the um, one of the most interesting things for me, bes besides reading about, you know, the specifically the Africa ship, um, which Tom mentioned, which in, for those of you who are not familiar, because I wasn't, um, is still still holds the record for the longest um what is it? The longest combat mission for a lighter than airship in the world, because we don't use a lot of those in combat anymore. Um, unlikely to be broken. What's, well, yeah, unlikely to be broken unlikely anytime broken. soon. <laughs> right. Um, but it's, it's, it's this incredible story uh, about this ship that, that makes this um, basically supply run, uh, you know, almost all the way down to to uh, their destination down in Africa, and then they get called back at the last minute, and they have to return, and they have all these like, you know, things befalling them that that make it a very difficult, uh, very harrowing experience. Um, but aside from that, I really I appreciated the opportunity to kind of dig into who the the imperial family were, and to kind of get to know them, and to realize that um, I don't like some of them like okay. at all. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, um, I, uh, Mickey and Alex, like it's, it's, I, I mean, honestly, it's hard to like they them. have redeeming they're... values, but they're hard to like. Well, and, and, you know, I think Mona Lisa, you and I've talked about this, like you have kids, I have kids as mothers. I find Alexandra's attitude incredibly offensive. <laughs> like, how do you not take every opportunity to save your children? You know what I mean? Like, What's that all about? Well, if you was, yeah, yeah. I was floored by her statement that she would rather die than let right. the Germans rescue them. Okay, right. if you right. want to die, you go ahead. You lay down and die. But you've got kids, right. and you've got four right. kids. I mean, yeah, she yeah. was nuts. Though. And you've already you've already sacrificed your country on the altar of your of your son's health. Like, right now, you're gonna let them die. I mean. What's yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not sure she was actually saved. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't think. Yeah. That well, that's another thing. You know, like it's it's very interesting to kind of look at at these characters with through the lens of 21st century um, paradigms, right? You know, the, the things that we know about mental health, the things that we openly talk about, uh, you know, or are are coming more open about talking about in our society. Um, I agree. It, Alexandra is a she's a very complex character, and uh, while I don't like her, <laughs> um, I do find her fascinating for sure. Well, and on the other hand, there's Tatiana, and you, how can you help but like Tatiana? Right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Mona Lisa, you did you wrote uh, the character of Tatiana for Romanov Rescue? What uh, what struck you about her? In particular, when you were reading, when you were learning about the the family, well, and then when you were you writing know, I about her, what I read some of the some of the diaries that that we had access to, and the thing is that they weren't particularly uh, deep in in sense of what her thoughts or opinions were. In fact, they were mostly just dates, you know, who we had lunch with, and and so on. It was. It's it's not like a, there was a character there whose head I could climb in, so right. I just made her up. Um, I try to put myself in the situation where um, you, as as a girl who have no power, um, mm -hmm. are, are thrust into this situation where all of a sudden you are responsible for your parents' bad decisions, uh, yeah. or you're being held responsible, or you have you know you have you, you're you're going to be made to pay for their bad decisions and um, trying to shape her as a character that later could become a leader. Um, and it's, so I just kind of, I made her up as I went, um, given, you know, some of the things that, that we, were, we were told, you know, to write. So um, that, that was, 
I mean, it was good in the sense that that I got you know to be able to do that, and I didn't have to try to fit her into a straight jacket uh, that that had been written by history. Right. Yeah. Because so there wasn't a lot of history there to make a straight jacket from. Yeah, right, I mean, yeah. What you get from the accounts is basically serious, responsible. That, she was that's a charge of Yeah, she that's what we have. And yeah. that, there's only, that's only a few instances in history. There's, you're right. There's not like, there's not a uh, uh, enhanced biography to go off of. So, and, and just so you know, Mona Lisa, Tatiana, our Tatiana is my favorite character in the book. So yeah. Thank you. I, I thought you did a great job. Thank you. That was an awesome segue, Justin, because I was just about to ask. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, okay, so 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 Tatiana is your favorite character. What yeah. who's your favorite character that you wrote? Uh, well, or who do you have the most fun writing? Let's put it that way. Two of them. No, um, Chekhov. Chekhov's yeah, favorite, that I wrote. Chekhov's my favorite character. Um, and why is that? Uh, well, so Chekhov is kind of the person Tatiana has to convince, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately Ch Chekhov is the Russian. Like there are Russians that as we go forward, Tatiana is just going to have to have killed because they're dedicated Bolsheviks, you know, and they, they're just, there is no place in the future for them. There are Russians who w will want Tatiana to succeed simply because she, they see her as the rightful heir to the throne or because they hate communism properly. Chekhov is the guy who has been wronged by the czars whose family suffered under Romanov rule, because let's not kid ourselves, the Romanovs were, especially by the time of Nicholas, they were a terrible dynasty. Yeah. Uh, you know, that they're in the running for worst monarchs of Europe uh, at that point. Um, so Chekhov is the guy who's legitimately been screwed by the system and still through both in, just intellectual honesty of what he sees in the Bolsheviks, and the bonds he forms with Tatiana and the other Romanov children comes around to do the right thing. Right. Um, and I enjoy that. So from a moralistic standpoint, I enjoy that. The other simpler reason is it's kind of my bread and butter as I love writing about soldiers and especially uh, junior enlisted NCOs. Uh, I was a junior officer. I got out as a captain. Uh, so I spent most of my time in the army still on the line with troops in platoons, companies, or batteries. And... Uh, and I know Thomas, this is not a unique sentiment to me. Thomas said this many times. Uh, being in a good combat arms unit is magic. Like, it mm -hmm. is a magical experience, and it's one hell of a lot of fun. Uh, and writing Chekhov and his buddy Dostavlov, even the, in the middle of apocalyptic events in Russia, was still, it's something that I, I enjoy doing. Uh, it resonates with me, and I, I hope people will will feel the the uh, the joy I had in writing it and be able to share in that a bit uh, sure. and, and, you know, be able to bond with those characters as well. But yeah, Chekhov and then Adostavlov was the other character I wrote the most of. Um, and I, I like them both, but Chekhov's, Chekhov was my guy. Like, I, I really enjoyed him. Chekhov is my favorite character that, that someone else wrote. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you wrote then. Uh, my, favorite one, my favorite one that I wrote was, uh, was probably uh, the airship captain. Um, Bockholz. Um, mm. He uh, he he just he was a he was an interesting character to write, and and I thought it was an interesting when we put it all together. One of the things that I found cool, um, and uh, I mean, I'm sure Tom, you know, is like, yeah, dumbass. This is why I had you write the aerial stuff. Is that the <laughs> the uh, it, it was very it was an interesting juxtaposition to see the dynamics of the airship crew and sort of they almost had like a like an almost optimistic worldview even though they're they're you know part of the german navy the war is not going well for germany at this point like they've lost a lot of their friends they still had a sort of like good mood yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean and then and then you 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 know you contrast that with with um uh, Chekhov and and Dostavlov and with you know Tom's guys that he was writing who were who were preparing to to go and do these like epic deeds and while they're hopeful they're not I wouldn't characterize them as as optimistic as <laughs> my airship crews you know what I mean um and they're I, Russians they have well a right outlook on life <laughs> sure but they're also but they're also um ground combatants versus aerial combatants. And there's a difference there. And I thought it was, I, I was, I was 
more surprised maybe than I should have been, um, but also kind of delighted to see that that reflected there because these guys are for sure air crew. They're well, air crew and they think like air crew because yeah. they're written by air crew. <laughs> <laughs> so. And that part early on, Casey, I know you, Casey went to the Air Force Academy. I went to West Point. Yeah. Whenever we escaped West Point, we were, you know, largely headed to a bar to start consuming alcohol. Uh, some years later, I was in Colorado Springs, uh, you know, just outside the Air Force Academy. And I'd see young group of groups of Air Force Academy cadets having nice dinners at the Olive Garden and very sedate. And I'm like, man, you guys are way too happy. <laughs> <laughs> like... Like, why aren't you drinking your sorrows away? Are they not? Are they not hurting you enough? Not oh, hurting you enough? <laughs> believe me, they did. They did. I, I know. <laughs> I did. I did. We had Tom, uh, Tom, five thousand years of. Well, we had to Justin. We had five thousand years of tradition. <laughs> okay. True. They don't. They're newcomers. They don't even know what misery is yet. Trench <laughs> foot. When's the last time they got trench foot? Um, yeah. education. I didn't mean to start in the service rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, what about what about you? Who is your favorite character, both to write and uh, and that uh, any of the rest of us had written? Oh, uh, Tatiana for written by others. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a, a lot going on there. I <laughs> I wish we could have saved her for real. Um, yeah. The uh, relative feminine pulchritude factor of the entire world dropped when she was shot. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to veer a little bit here. In romance, um, one of the things that distinguishes it is that the romance itself is a character Yeah. in the story. Military science fiction, and this is about 60%, maybe 65% military science fiction, um, or military alternate history. Uh, there are several characters that aren't characters. Uh, the organization is a character. The, the plan is a character. The preparation is a character. And the actual execution of the mission is a character. So, um, my favorite character among those is the preparation. That's uh, always your answer. That it's, it's that that's kind of your that, that's your that's your button. thing. <laughs> yeah, that's my thing. Um, <laughs> but my favorite my favorite actual human character that I wrote is Dan, and mm -hmm. uh, the actual Dan Daniel Kostashakov, who is based on a friend of mine, uh, Dan Kostashak, West Point, 1980, uh, died about nine years ago of some kind of cancer. I don't know what it was, and um, I don't want him dead, so I brought him back to life. He's uh, a good character. He's a lot of fun. Yeah, I liked him a lot too. Uh, Mona Lisa, we kind of we kind of skipped over you. Um, <laughs> who is, who, like yeah, right. Yeah, who who was your favorite character written by written by someone else? Because you really only wrote Tatiana. <laughs> so. I only wrote Tatiana, so yeah, there, the answer there is obvious. Um, I really liked Justin's Justin's two guys. I want to know is it Sergey? Is it the Chekhov and Sergey? Yeah, the same guy? Sergei, yeah. But but not because you go by last names and I go by first. Yeah, it's what I did for ten years. We're we're all our last names in the army <laughs> in the military for a while. Because I remember that conversation yeah. we had. You think of yourself and, as your first name or your last name. Yeah. Yeah, that 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 was a very interesting conversation. But mm -hmm. I really liked him because he was just such a well fleshed out good guy. Um, he wasn't a gratuitous good guy. He wasn't a hero just because he set out to be a hero. He was a hero because he was just a good person. And yeah. um, I really, really liked him as a um, foil for, for Tatiana. And yeah. um, you and I also had this conversation about them not really, uh, I mean, they were about the same age, so we could very easily turn into romantic interest, but there wasn't. It, that wasn't his motivation at all. It was, he was just into doing the right thing. And yeah. I really loved that about the characters that you wrote. Yeah, me too. Know, Which is weird, you, somebody who's actually a romance writer, right? But <laughs> yes, I did like the reason I liked him. Well, we have, you, we have romantic subplots in, in the story. It's not like they're not there, but I just didn't think that Tatiana, I agree with you. I don't think Tatiana and Chekhov 
it wasn't really a romantic ever meant to be a romantic subplot and and yeah like Chekhov is his his angst comes from the fact that you're right he his mom and dad like he got a moral compass along the way despite everything that's happened to him and he lives in a world where that's incredibly inconvenient well and you're you said it too he's intellectually honest mm -hmm. and and it's that intellectual honesty that puts him in the position where he has to confront these hatreds that he holds for really good reason and and decide whether or not they apply in this particular situation and i find that to be like i find that to be fascinating um hey, you know, you know when, what i like best about him yes Check sir out. what's that sir he's capable of coldly killing someone when that someone needs killing <laughs> yeah that's pretty yeah. cool too. yeah well i mean he yeah. is a veteran of you know he's a vet he's a he ho he holds the uh saint george's medal uh the order of saint george sorry he he holds the order of saint george he's he was on the front in the great war for many many moons yeah uh, yeah he's not he he believes in right and wrong like he cares but he's not overly sentimental once someone is a fairly clear threat yeah so <laughs> i want to shift gears just a little bit and tom you you alluded to or flat out stated this earlier when you said 19 books um let you know without without giving spoilers as best we can where do we see this going and uh we'll we'll start with you tom where where do you see this going or tell give the give the people a hint as to where we're going with all this i'll, I'll, I'll give a pretty good hint um four volumes at least of the russian civil war and final restoration of peace then at least a couple of volumes of the rise of the nazis and a couple more of the fixing of russia you know, without Stalinist collectivization, um, turning Russia, Russia was on the road to becoming a, a, a first class power by 1914. It had something to do with why the Germans were sort of eager for war, uh, to take them out while they still could, um, but turn Russia into a non-communist power. Some advantages, uh, people won't have, no Lysenkoism is a biggie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also no 10 million slaves laboring in Siberia for resources either. So, you know, it'll be a little plus, a little minus. Um, the Nazis are still going to rise because even if there's no money coming from the, uh, from the Kremlin, a lot of Russian commies will have escaped to Germany. So that won't change anything. Um, and that will terrify the Germans who will support Hitler. Uh, from there, uh, World War II probably won't do much with Poland, won't do much with France, but will do Zay Adler. And then several volumes, a uh, couple anyway, of the Soviet, of the German invasion of Russia. Um, and we're going to have to build in some realistic problems because without Stalin and the purges, the Russian army should be better than the Red Army was. Uh, we, we have some ideas along those lines. Uh, shift over to the Pacific. Um, we will never have gotten in, into an undeclared war with Germany because the UK will have sued for peace in 1940. So everything that we gave to, um, to the UK and Australia too, for that matter, to keep them in the war is available to be used for our own war. And there's only one war we've got on the horizon at that, that point in time. Japan and specifically the Philippines. So we're gonna have a really nice time defending the Philippines. Um, that war being over, we go into a cold war and an eventual hot war with Nazi Europe. So how many times, five yeah, times on the horizon. Um, on like, we don't have, I wouldn't call it an outline, uh, but having like a vague roadmap of that, like this, I think we have it out to about the early '70s. Not yeah. no, nothing's concrete. Obviously, we still are. We're very flexible based on where the stories go. But um, yeah, no, there's a lot to unpack there, and it's it's all very exciting. Uh, I love World War One. I, I love World War Two. I'm really looking forward to Cold War because uh, as an, an '80s and '90s kid, like my childhood was the end of the Cold War. Um, I don't miss communists, but they were a really good bad guy. They were. They were. Um <laughs> There's a, a lot of opportunity here to really fuck with the 60s, uh, with the, the left of the 60s. You know, when Abby Hoffman and, and Jerry, what's his name, 
um, are working for the Nazis. You know, I mean, they work for the com the commies. Why? Because they were enemies of, of America. They'll do mm -hmm. the same thing with the Nazis. Doesn't matter if they're Jewish. Yeah. Well, the Nazis are going to have all those wonderful social programs, and you know. Yes, they them. will. Yeah. And maybe so then me, we'll see to creating uh, to re making Israel. Mm -hmm. Guys, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt, but Mona Lisa's um, in the middle of a lightning storm right now, so uh, she's going to have to go. But thank you so much for joining us, Mona Lisa. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I'm also really excited about, um, you know, obviously I love, I love military history. I love military alternate history. I love, you know, reading about these, these great epic sweeping battles. But uh -huh. the other thing that I'm excited about throughout like the progression of all of this is the human element of who, you know, who did the Romanovs become? Who did their heirs become? Who who are the people who are involved in all of these in all of these events that we're hinting at? Um, and I'm super excited to to explore all of that. I'm looking forward to the scene where Tatiana writes a letter to her cousin asking why his worthless shit of a son um, is failing in French and history. Because yeah, he's a potential mm -hmm. candidate to be her heir. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I cannot wait for the next volume, Casey, because you have obviously like you have a lot of axes with which to explore that in the next book. And it's going to be really cool. So, right. So cool. Um, should we talk about that then? <laughs> so well, the next book. There several, I think. I, I did, but oh, we'll come back to it. Um, the, <laughs> next, the next book is tentatively titled The Winner of Sapphire and Steel. And um, in, this, in this book, um, what we've got going on is Tatiana consolidating power in Russia, uh, we've got the continuation of the Russian Civil War with the Imperial Army, um, you know, struggling to hang on to what it's what it's got and uh, to to continue to make progress against the Bolsheviks, and we've got Tatiana making political moves using her sisters, um, her, her her two surviving sisters, um, as leverage the way that you know also royal and imperial families have for history for all of history. What's that, Tom? Also getting them to safety, and, yeah. and getting them to safety There's absolutely. Or so yeah. she thinks. Or, or yeah. doing her best, doing her best to do so. Um, and, and so that's something that, that you know, I'm, I, I'm super excited about because, you know, who doesn't love writing about fractious political arranged marriages? <laughs> so, and not so arranged marriages, too. Cause and get, not so arranged marriages. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things I'm most excited about in your, uh, your arcs in Sapphire of Steel, Casey, is that you really are going to do, you have that uh, a plot line in Britain and a plot line in America and it's very old world, new world. Yeah. You know, the collision and the similarities, the differences and the synergies and the conflicts all swirling about to try to, you know, and the, the Romanov girls having to manage all that is pretty right. fantastic. Like I'm, right. I'm excited to see what you do with it. And um, I get to do, I get to do something really cool, which is bring someone back from the dead who was a fascinating, fascinating individual. And that's um, Quentin Roosevelt, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's son. Um, which, you know, in, in a real lunatic, like in terms of bravery. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like crazy. But, um, in real life he died, he was killed in a dog fight. Um, but we brought him back and, and we were able to do so because, um, Tom figured out this, this, you know, sequence of events that would result in him not being ambushed in a dog fight, you know, as happened in real life. Yeah, so that, mm -hmm. that kind of brings me to, um, to another point I, I wanted to discuss, which is, when we're writing alternate history, how do we decide what stays and what goes? Um, and I'm I'm going to start with Justin on this one because Tom, I know you have a lot to say, and I want to finish on you. So, what about you, Justin? When we're writing alternate history, how do you decide what stays from real history and what goes? Well, for for this, it's collaborative, right? To a certain yeah. extent, if you're going to make any kind of major historical pivot, we're going to talk about it. And and Tom's the senior partner, so he doesn't get the final say. You know, if, if it doesn't if it doesn't track, he does get to override. But, he, you know, I, it, what I would say is the first principle is flow logically from the point of departure. Yeah. You know, that, that's the first principle. Second principle is due diligence for, you know, what what was there and what wasn't in terms of like, is it, you know, could, could we posit um, more or less naval construction on the part of United States or Japan based on our World War One and Russian Civil War turning out somewhat differently. 
Well, maybe, but we actually have to we have to talk about that and make an intelligent decision on it. We can't just say, well, America made 50 more carriers in World War II lasted six months and Japan lost. You know, right. like like the, the, it's basically rigor is, is yeah. what I would say is, is the principle. So for me, that's really what dictates is I, you know, we flow logically from the point of departure, assuming that anything that changes has to be something that, uh, that originated from that change. Right. You know, like that it's not like, you know, there was, you know, uh, I don't know, like Pancho Villa got more or less aggressive because something that was happening in the Russian Civil War without drawing a good connection. Sure. Um, you know, so that's the first principle. Um, I will say that it's going to be interesting going forward because the further we get away from our point of departure, the bigger, the, 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 the wider the variance. Right. Um, there's still a lot of research to do, but like there's a lot of things that can happen. You know, yeah. if we play a 19 plus volume series as we, you know, we have the steam to do um, if these if these books do well enough. Um, there's a lot of knock on effects and there's a lot of things that we're going to be, you know, making educated estimates on uh, because yeah. it would have gone wildly differently uh, based on who was where when. You know, we're not doing, you know, the most maybe the, the most famous and common. What if uh, a Bavarian corporal takes a bullet at Eep? You know, right. like, you know, we're not doing that one, but like that in the future, you know, there are plenty of people who are risking their lives in World War II who were pivotal in the Cold War. You know, one of those guys gets blown away or one of those guys lives or gals right. uh, in some cases lives, then, you know, they're available or they're not for future mm -hmm. events. So um, yeah. it's really just, you know, trying to make sure this, the, the spaghetti that sticks to the wall is the best spaghetti and it makes sense. And I think one of my favorite things about this whole process has been some of the conversations that we have where we have this realization like, oh, shit, mm -hmm. if we don't, we, the United States, don't go to war in Europe, then we, the United States, don't have Operation Paperclip. That means yeah. we, the United States, don't have Werner von Braun. Yep. Right? What does that mean for our space program? <laughs> what does yeah. that mean for okay. our nuclear weapons? Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> All of those postulations. I think those have been some of my favorite part of this whole process. Yeah, and we don't benefit from the heavy water war efforts. Right, of right. Bridge, you know, like, or we may yeah. benefit from the, the heavy water. You know, like, there's a lot of stuff that's very makes it a lot makes the the 50s and 60s a lot more interesting 100 um, percent. yeah yeah well, we're Tom, what get, about you we're gonna get well let me address that and then i will please uh we're gonna get nukes first because we're the the brits are gonna do go out of their way before they knuckle under to send everything tube alloys has to us sure um, along with their radar research etc cetera, etc cetera. so we'll have proximity shells we'll have nukes first and we the talked Germans, about the concept of a of a, a free British government in exile too. Right, either yeah. up in Canada or down in one of the islands. Yeah. Um, along with a good deal of the Royal Navy defecting to us, uh, which is going to be important because Pearl Harbor is not going to happen exactly the same way as it did. Yeah. Um, Von Braun was copy, copying Goddard to a good de degree. I I think we'll catch up. Um, and the Germans had some peculiar ways of doing scientific research. They were very poor in terms of instruments to measure things at the time. What they had was a bunch of, oh, imagine 30 junior scientists standing around with notepads, writing down everything that they observed very quickly. Mm -hmm. That was really how they did it. Mm -hmm. So now, um, what was your question? The the original question again? Exactly. How do you how do you decide what stays and what goes from real history when writing alternate history? Oh, um, well, you start with your point of departure. Yeah. You made one change. In this case, our change is from something very trivial indeed. Uh, a German officer decided to take a, a different turn on his nightly walk. Um, an important German officer. Uh, after that, you know, well would it still have happened this way? I mean, you, you basically put it through a bunch of filters. Would it still have happened this way? Sure. Yes. Uh, for example, will the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk still kick off uh, bringing Russia out of the war? Yes, because Hoffman is keeping the Africa ship project um, very secret. It's, mm -hmm. it's all basically done in his back pocket. Mm -hmm. So nothing's going to change in terms of peace between, between Russia and the U.S. 
if we shift over to the uh, to the Western Front, is anything going to change? No, because what Hoffman drew for this rescue effort was trivial. Mm -hmm. um, as we go on, some things are, you know, like some material things are going to stay the same. The Russians aren't going to have T-34s in 1922. Um, you know, they may not have T-34s at all. We're, we're, we're going to have to go down the list of every senior engineer involved in Soviet weapons development mm -hmm. and make a judgment call of, okay, would he have seen the writing on the walls and gone with Tati early enough? Mm -hmm. Would he not have? You know, uh, mm -hmm. will Dan see the Fedorov, probably the first assault rifle in history? And decide, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. You know, mm -hmm. maybe he will. <laughs> well, we'll have sure. to make a judgment call on each of those. Um, you know, can we ch change things around the margins the way we saved Quentin? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, we can. We can make a. You know, just just because we can change history there. We've got a, a credible way to do it that flows reasonably well. Yeah. From the um, from the point of departure. Mm -hmm. uh, do we make we can make junior characters and then promote them, but we probably can't pull a field marshal out of our ass who didn't exist. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. So what I'm hearing you both say, and and this is, you know, I agree. Um it, it just comes back to the basic, the first basic principle of, of writing fiction, right? Like you've, you've got to make it believable for the reader, even fiction if they know it didn't fiction. happen. Yeah. Yeah. Even if they know it didn't happen that way, it, mm -hmm. it's got to be logical. It's got to, it's got to flow and it's got to follow and it's got to be hopefully entertaining. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I, I've really enjoyed, I think I was entertained writing this. So I think the people are really going to, Really going to enjoy it. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, let's take a minute and appreciate the gorgeous cover art that Bain has sourced for us. Um, I, I think we can get a I think we can get a, a flash of that up on the screen here. But um, yeah, there it is. Uh, how cool is this cover, guys? <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's an, an eight or nine hundred foot long penis. It has to appeal to <laughs> some audience. I mean, you know, Bane is known for the Bane is known for the TNA covers. I, I feel like a little equal time is appropriate, right? Am I right? It's entirely appropriate. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, I'm such a Heinlein fanboy. I read uh, Grumbles from the Grave, and there was a letter from his editor to his agent back to Heinlein about in the juvenile book Space Cadet, the silver rockets thrusting against the velvety blue sky was too phallic. Um, that just put me in mind of that. Uh, <laughs> he, got a, he got a note from his editor on that one. So yeah, just, that's funny. That, that cover put me in a, put me in mind of Heinlein, which is never. Absolutely. A <laughs> <laughs> um, um, we've only got a, a few minutes left, but um, I did want to, cause I know people always ask this whenever I've done collaborations and I've done quite a few of them. Let's talk a little bit about our process. Like how did we take all of these parts and and kind of put them together uh and i'm going to direct this at justin first because at least in my head you were kind of the the chief cat herder <laughs> of this group <laughs> so <laughs> it depends on how you define it like uh, <laughs> uh i was maybe the feather smoother and uh you know <laughs> re referee i guess i don't know what you want to call it. So uh, leaving aside the crying and the screaming and the recriminations, I'd say it was very much a, uh, we had an outline to go off of, um, yeah. which I blithely ignored. No, I, I, I'm sorry, that that's not quite true. I, I took- oh, You ignored it willfully and deliberately, yes. <laughs> it wasn't blithe at all. I took- With extreme prejudice. Sure, I took <laughs> the initiative. Um, but no, we, uh, it really was a matter of, um, you know, each of us, I think each of us gave more than could fit in the book. And that gave Tom a great problem, I'm going to say, mm -hmm. for him, before he gets a chance to contradict me. <laughs> uh, gave Tom a great problem of having too much good shit to fit in a few hundred pages. Uh, yeah. Between what I wrote, what you wrote, Mona Lisa. And I was definitely, like, to be clear, I was the most guilty party. Um, way, way 
Yeah. Oh God, I I was terrible. Um, uh, I, I, it was good uh, shit. It was good shit. Thank you. Thank you. It, it was, and with some editing, it could be worked into a collection of mm-hmm. shorts yeah. to accompany the book. You know, the, the series. Yeah. Later yeah. On. I, 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 and to be clear, like when I sent it in, I, I said, I was like, I realize we're going to have to cut a lot of this, <laughs> but I had to write it like for my, for me and, and to get settled into Chekhov and Dostovolov, I, I had to write that stuff. I knew a lot of it was not going to go in the book. Like I understood it was going to be a, a discussion of no, Justin, you can't keep that or that or that either. <laughs> you know, like you really yeah. have to distill this down because it's not your book, your third chair. Like, you know, I mean, it is my book, clearly. I, my, my name's on the cover with you guys, but, um, you know, I was not supposed to, I, I was the, I was the tight end making a block, not the halfback carrying the ball. So I needed to, to know my place in the team, but I don't regret writing it. Cause like you said, Tom, I imagine we will make use of that material at some yeah. point. Somewhere. You never throw anything away. You'll find a yeah. use for it. Yeah, yeah. and, I, and I, I did enjoy writing it, and I, I think, but I do think the right process happened to cut what I wrote down to fit in the confines of this story, um, so that Chekhov and Dostovlov had their correct role right. um, in the book, and they weren't, you know, they weren't trying to be all diva about it. Um, so yeah, that that was that was how the process worked. For, looked from my end was. A lot of discussions over uh, Messenger, mm-hmm. uh, a couple Zooms, uh, Liberty Con meetings, of course. Uh, and then, you know, we'd go back, we'd write, we'd come back together, look at it, you know, have disagreements of varying degrees of stridence. Uh, and then, you know, it, 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 we, we'd end up uh, either coming to consensus or Tom would say, you know what, I, I, I think I know what's best. We're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and then, and then we we move forward, and you know the book is is in and still due out in November. So I'm, and I think it's going to be fantastic. Um, I yeah. know it's fantastic because I've read it, but I think people are going to love it. Tom, before you answer, I want I kind of want to hear your answer as filtered through. How is how was this collaborative process working with the three of us? How did that compare to working? you know, to, to your army experience working with, with junior officers. I was way kinder and way more democratic than I've <laughs> ever been in my life about anything. <laughs> when I was a small child. <laughs> You're very, very conscious of our fragile writer egos. <laughs> and, yeah. and I'm not sure everyone appreciated that. <laughs> I knew. I, I do, I, I for do. sure. <laughs> um, but no, like, like, how was? I mean, because you, you, you've done collaborations before, but, um, but not for a while. How was this? How was this? Uh, yeah, the collaborations were, with Ringo were something a little different. Sure. Um, yeah, it's a different paradigm. Absolutely. No, no, no. I, I mean, I tried to write a collaborative novel with John and John Ringo, and I couldn't. Mm-hmm. I wrote fourteen thousand words in a year and hated every one of them separately, but equally. Yeah. <laughs> And and so what I ended up writing was me playing in his universe. And I'd make him put a sentence in every book so Jim Bain couldn't make precarious liars about us. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair right. enough. So I, I had a good deal of Terra Nova, The Wars of Liberation, was about seeing whether I could temperamentally collaborate mm-hmm. or work with other people. Because I couldn't so far as I knew. And it worked reasonably well. Uh, reviews reasonably well, so, mm-hmm. uh, and it was even almost a fun pain in the ass, maybe. Yeah. Um, My wife describes me too. <laughs> so, uh, having done Terra Nova, and deciding that maybe I could do this, um, it wasn't so hard. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I know I'm anal retentive as shit about some things, and I'm not the easiest guy to work with, of course. So, you know, you're not, you're, you're by far not the worst boss I've had. Yes, yeah. <laughs> no, nor, nor the, nor the most difficult collaborative partner that I've ever had, for sure. Yeah, but I was um, trying really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I will say one thing, though. You know, I mean, we give you a lot of shit about, you know, being 
you know, being a crusty infantry commander and, and, you know, being a hard ass and stuff. And it's all warranted. But um, <laughs> I will also say that there were a couple of times when you would say, hey, I want to do this thing with, with this piece you wrote. And I disagreed. And I came back and I was like, I don't want to. And here's why. And even if at the end you said, no, what we're going to do is what I said, which I think only really happened once, most of the time, like it was actually a discussion. Like it wasn't, I felt engaged in the process, right? And I and I felt like my, like you valued my my input and my production and my perspective on whatever it was that we were discussing. Um, and yeah, so, I, you know, as much I shit as we that. give you, I think you're, I think you're a good co-writer. You just don't want to admit it. <laughs> Yeah, I'll back Casey up on that, Tom, is like, yeah, yeah, I got overridden a couple times, but it was always like, in comparison to the couple times I was flat out overridden, there were a dozen middle of the road, like, you know, it's some of you, some of me, like, this will probably turn out better. Yeah. So I never felt like you overrode me just to, just to do it. Right. You know? yeah. like, like it was, it was to make the book better. It wasn't exactly, you know, it wasn't freaking you know, it wasn't an ego display, which as you and I both know, like we've, we've both worked with and for officers who would have a giant case of not invented here syndrome. And I never felt that was the case. So yeah, I always did what I wanted to anyway. So, yeah. Um, yeah, there, I, I try, I consciously try actually to make the two most common words in editorial comments. Think about. Yeah. Uh, or three most words, think about or contemplate just because I don't like to be redundant. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of doing this, think about doing that. Yeah. 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 And it, I mean, I, I think that that worked. I think that that, that that makes for a, a open flow of ideas. That's pretty um, necessary to really any sort of collaborative effort, but certainly something like this that, you know, is so complicated and gets more complicated by the day. <laughs> so yeah. yeah oh, we haven't sure. seen nothing yet. It's going to get worse. I know. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> Yeah. I do. I also want to point something out too. Like, I don't know whether or not you meant to do this, Justin, but um, I really appreciate that you're like the keeper of the continuity for all of this because <laughs> you. <laughs> I think it. I think it started with you. You being sort of the keeper of the outline, and it just sort of grew from there. So, um, as the timeline gets more and more um, complicated, I just <laughs> want you to know that I appreciate you more and more every day. <laughs> you're welcome. Well, I can find. Uh, the, the, like I said, the, the staff skills of a, uh, an army staff bitch, <laughs> I did spend time doing that with yeah. the fact that I'm a little more techie than Tom, you know, <laughs> it's not that hard to be, you know? Yeah. I, I know, I know. Um, that's why I sent you that Monty Python meme. <laughs> we yeah. Zoom call. Um, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a natural fit and I really don't mind. It's, it's fine. <laughs> I've got to mention something else that I really yeah. enjoyed about doing this. And it, it, it has to do with techie. Um, and it's solving technical problems. You, you, it's, it's steampunky, basically. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know, how are we going to do this? <laughs> <laughs> how are we going to affect the rescue? Well, we were going to blind them. How? We we're going to take German grenades, take out most of the TNT, fill them with flash powder, and use those as flashbangs. How are the, the rescue force then going to see? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Someone wants to talk about setting yourself on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Tom was so committed to this story, he literally nearly self-immolated writing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> With a carbide lamp. It's just disabled right now because I don't trust it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, how much, how much light? I, I had four of them going in our uh, – it's a combination library, annex, wife's gym, and formerly TV room. And I had four, four of them going in that room just to see if there was enough light to see everything, mm. you know, or carbide lamps going. It was fun to do that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. It's cheap to do that kind of thing, but it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's, it's also necessary because, you know, um, uh, you know, being veterans of, you know, Tom's obviously. <laughs> nice. This conversation just got at least 20% cooler. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh you know, Tom and I like are were in different armies to a large degree. I don't. Th I think you were out like a year before I was in, or something like that. I, I was in and out, all told, five or six times. 
Yeah, yeah. But like your very last tour, I think you got out in what, 2003? No, 2000. My, my last tour was at the War College, and I, I retired officially in 2006, but I've been okay. term to leave for a few months by then. Okay, so we had like w less than one year of overlap. So we served in different armies, but we both have, we both worked with very similar constraints. You know, we had very similar gear. You know, like I had some new stuff that was shitty. He had some old stuff that was shitty, but we, we had very similar gear. You know, to think about stuff that we both know, at least, I know at least conceptually, I was not an infantryman by trade, but, you know, I went, you know, we, we kicked down doors in Iraq all the time. Um, and everything was in the city. So I like clearing a room is something basically any meeting at meat eating MOS in the army did for several years in the army before we got back to our actual jobs, uh, in our case, the cannons. Um, so to figure out how they would do it in 1914 or 1918 in this case, when that wasn't the presumption, obviously they have been fighting in cities, but there wasn't they didn't operate under the same set of assumptions. They didn't have the same gear. They didn't have radios in backpacks for right. infantry units right. to keep contact with each other outside of visual range easily. They, they had messengers wire and signal flares. Yeah, exactly. So all the constraints that, you know, we don't even think of. And then all the things that are drilled into us about noise and light discipline or keep your finger off the goddamn trigger or things like that that are, you know, so drilled into modern soldiers that, you know, it's it's second nature. You know, but you see pictures of dudes in World War One with their their hand over the muzzle of their rifle. You know, hardened combat yeah. weapons, and you you want to have apople apoplexy from it because you're like Jesus Christ, like don't point the gun at anything you don't want to shoot. Um, but it's just that's that's us several generations hence knowing, mm -hmm. hey, don't walk on the road, spread out into a V. You know, like you know, like all the things that from the time you're 18 on, you're it's drilled into your head, don't do. And yeah, no, that that was terribly interesting. Uh, and Tom, we talked about how like these guys are, you know, now we don't know if Russia how much use Russia will make of it, but they now have the preeminent hostage rescue force in the world um, by default. Just because they lose, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. but still, you know, like even yeah. given that, name a more high-profile, high-risk, uh, more tactically complex hostage rescue that happened that before that date. I can't think of one. Yeah, me neither. Me neither. And, you know, it's it's interesting that you say that because that's a lot of the same stuff that I discovered with with, you know, writing the airship crews. Right. Uh, there the, the ways in which we conduct combat aviation. Now, granted, this is a generalization because, you know, it varies by weapon system. But the ways in which we conduct combat aviation operate under a certain set of assumptions. And a lot of those assumptions have to do with things like radar and yeah. um Night the ability, night vision, right? Uh, the ability to contact home station, right? Communications, mm -hmm. stuff like that. None of that. They didn't have, you know, they didn't have any of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, and in fact, that's that's one of the major major plot points of the real life story of the Africa ship was was degraded communications based on what they had available. So, um, really cool stuff. Really interesting stuff. Guys, we're about out of time, um, so I I want to wrap this up, but um, I kind of want to give everyone the opportunity to do um, a last word. Uh, so, Justin, you first. What's the last thing you want these people to remember about this panel from you? Go. Uh, this was a very intense, very fun, very hard-fought book. You know, mm -hmm. like this was not a casual foray in many ways into the genre. You know, we, 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 this was blood, sweat, and tears in a good way. You know, like, um, you've heard Tom talk about the lengths to which he would go for research. The fact that, that Russian money is four times the dimension of American money changed an entire major salient plot point of the book. Like, if you're a history nerd like me, um, and especially if you love Tom Crapman's signature, uh, here's how you train for uh, sequences uh, and just, really universal themes of valor, sacrifice, um, anti-communism. Uh, if, if you're, if any of that appeals to you, I encourage you to pick it up and give it a try. I think it's a great book. Uh, I can't wait to see what everyone thinks about it. Um, yeah, that, that's what I've got. Well said. Tom? Russian reaction. Um, I, will, I will be very interested in, in what the Russians reaction. I hope they enjoy it because there's a lot to admire about the Russian people. Um, that they've really gotten screwed. By the way, I, I feel like I have to mention, we had a Russian helping us. 
um, former Russian army, former Russian cop, I believe, uh, Rostislav Mokrenko. And, you know, like, Rostislav, I'm trying to find the power plant in Tobolsk. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And he comes back five minutes later. It's about 300 meters north of the governor's house. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was super, super useful. Um, anything else, Tom, to, about the, you want, that you want to throw out there? Uh, I've been, about the book, I, I think it's good. Um, I think you'll enjoy it if you like anything, even if you don't like anything that I ever wrote, I, I still think you'll enjoy it. <laughs> um, it. It's different from anything I've ever written, although there are, of course, points of similarity. Um, and I tend to do a lot of different alternate history as long as we're on this. Mm. You know, I want to do a Roman legion that gets catapulted forward in time, uh, almost 400 years, and gets back to the Rhine just in time to help stop the uh, barbarians from crossing the Rhine on New Year's Eve, 405 AD. You know, I want to do one with Ho Chi Minh, who gets taken under wing by a Boston Brahmin while he's a pastry chef at the Parker House. Uh, in Boston, sent to Harvard before it turned into a uh, into a haven for Reds, uh, <laughs> and decides to base his Vietnamese independence movement more on George Washington and Thomas Jefferson uh, mm -hmm. than on Marx and Lenin and Mao. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm looking forward to Zay Adler for the sheer military joy of the operation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to all of that for the, to see the fruits of the seeds that we're planting now in Romanov Rescue and in Sapphire and Steel. Um, yeah. Because uh, I I have always been uh, fascinated by the dynamics of royal and imperial families and the ways in which, you know, they're so much the same as far as like family dynamics of, you know, as everyone else, they're just as dysfunctional, if not more so. And how <laughs> that- British royal family, for example. Right, exactly. But those, but that dysfunction ripples throughout geopolitics because of who they are and the position that they're in. And I'm, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how the the ripples that we are causing um, manifest themselves. So, um, yeah, I uh, I love this book. I'm so proud to have to have been invited to be part of of this collaboration. It was a it was a real pleasure working with you guys. It was a um, painful pleasure at times, but real, <laughs> but real. <laughs> and uh, um, <laughs> um, yeah, I just, uh, I think people are really going to like this. So um, thank you guys. Thanks everyone out there in Liberty Con for hanging out with us uh, for the last hour or so. Uh, we hope you give, uh, uh, give us a shot, pick up the Romanov Rescue. We're, it's uh, slated to come out November 2nd, I believe. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, if we could get another shot of the cover up there, um, let you guys look at that beautiful phallic artwork one more time. And uh, <laughs> available uh, pre-order now. Uh, yeah, it is. It's uh, you can get it in in e -Arc now too. So, um, all right. Thank you so much uh, once again. My name is Casey. It, it can't be and, uh, e already, is it? No, it's on Amazon for pre-order. Sorry. Casey. Oh, sorry. Pre-order, not a, not yeah, e -Arc. Yeah, I missed yeah, it's, it's pre-order on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and stuff, but no, the e -Arc's not ready yet. Not yet. Um, but soon. Soon. So uh, yeah, check it out. And uh, we will talk to you guys later. Good night. <laughs>